Uh, we're going to be talking about Stoicism, and I'm, I'm largely going to be talking about Stoicism. So uh, the title is Stoicism versus Objectivism versus puts it a little more antagonistically than I want it. Um, and I'll be talking about mostly Stoicism, but then looking at it more from an obje objectivist perspective uh, rather than trying to introduce the whole objectivist perspective on the issue. But you can feel free to ask. I'm going to leave plenty of question, time for questions at the end, uh, so you'll get plenty of time to ask questions about that. Um, how many of you, uh, now the mic won't pick your voices up so much, so I'll repeat it, but how many of you guys are familiar with, have some familiarity with Stoicism as a philosophy? Okay, lots of hands. Um, that's interesting. Um, what about Epicureanism? Right, maybe a smattering. Versus, okay, <laughs> so people can't, this is not picking up you guys, so lots of hands came up uh, when I asked the question about Stoicism. Epicureanism, no. Pyrrhonism. No hands. Okay, so <laughs> we got one philosophy PhD back there. Okay. <laughs> Dan, you win the prize. There'll be a stuffed animal. Um, yeah, so a part of the reason I wanted to talk about Stoicism is because it is becoming more popular today. Um, people are starting to look back toward... Uh, to look to philosophy and specifically to ancient philosophies for some kind of practical guidance, wisdom, you know, something to help them uh, manage their life, manage their frustrations, to give them some kind of a perspective on life. Uh, and many today are turning to Stoicism. This is in part because, um, I mean, if you go back a little bit and look at the academic world, uh, since the 70s and 80s and 90s, we started to get a lot more academic, re real deep research into, into Stoic philosophy. A lot of really quality stuff has been coming out, uh, and that has produced a lot of uh, really good literature on the philosophy. And then it has started to trickle into the popular culture. Uh, so you'll find books, How to Be a Stoic, you know, uh, The Stoic Art of Living or Finding Happiness. So there's all sorts of these kinds of popular books that are coming out. Some are by philosophers and some are by psychologists, uh, some are by just popular writers. You think of people like Ryan Holiday or Tim Ferriss that are kind of tapping into philosophy to kind of give some kind of practical guidance, tips, hacks, uh, perspective. Um, now, if you're not familiar or that familiar with Stoic philosophy, I'll just say, I mean, we'll be talking about the philosophy, but just, so this is an ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, it flourished in the Hellenistic period, so Hellenistic period is basically 323 BC, if you care about the dates. The dates are kind of interesting because the 323 BC is the death of Alexander the Great, and in the following year, the death of the real great Aristotle um, three, in 322 BC. Um, and this goes to um, 27 BC. That, that's the period during which all the major Hellenistic philosophies were formulated, so Epicureanism, Stoicism, Pyrrhonism. Uh, and then it flourished, continued to flourish from 27 BC to 476 AD. So basically what, what we're looking at is 323 to 27 is that 27 is the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the Roman Empire. And 27 to 476 gives you the whole period of the Roman Imperial period. Now that period, the Roman Imperial period, is where we get a lot of the Stoics that we actually are much more familiar with today. So if we go in order, Seneca, Epictetus and the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. So you can find Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, which I recommend you read. It's really interesting, uh, and it's really his own just reflections, his bringing his philosophy to mind to help keep reminding himself on a daily basis to, to have a perspective and to remember how to properly evaluate things, how to judge things. Um, I think probably something one should do more of is to, is to bring one's philosophy more on a regular basis back into one li one's life. Um, and you can find for, for Epictetus, I think the work to look at, well, we have two things, this thing called hand, the handbook, which is tiny. It's more like a summary of doctrines. Uh, and his discourses, uh, Epictetus' discourses, if you're interested in that. Seneca is a wonderful writer. Uh, and so if you look up Seneca's letters, uh, I think you'll find those in both in just simply aesthetically enjoyable to read in addition to just interesting, to uh, bringing you to see what uh, Stoicism has to say as a philosophy. Um, so I think it's interesting as a philosophy, but part because I studied ancient Greek philosophy and I've studied Stoicism in graduate school and I thought that this was really interesting, but 
I think the fact that people are finding this value, I mean, look, we're, we're selling a philosophy, so to speak, <laughs> objectivism, uh, and we're trying to promote the ideas, we're trying to explain to people what we think is important, what we think is valuable about it, like this is valuable perspective and it can help you with your life. Um, and the people who are promoting Stoicism today are doing the same thing. So look at these ideas, look how these can help you, and uh, people are finding it valuable. Um, and one key element of Stoic philosophy, which I think people are finding valuable, is the, um, the subject of this talk. It's they made a big deal of, and I think they get credit for the, being the first to make a really big deal of the fact that you have to distinguish between the kinds of things that are up to us and that are not up to us, the kinds of things that are under one's control and the kinds of things that you can't control. Um, because that's going to color your whole, and being able to make that difference and, and drawing the difference correctly. Because that, that pers your perspective on what you can control and what you can't control colors what you can expect of yourself what you can demand of yourself and what you shouldn't demand of yourself, um, what you can expect or demand of others and what you shouldn't. Um, if, you, if you think some things that uh, are up to you, they're under your control, you can handle them, you can change them and you can't, what's going to happen? Frustration, failure, sometimes what else? With a G. Guilt, yeah. Um, and likewise, the kinds of things you think I can't control that. I can't, I can't make any change in that area. It's just, there's nothing I can do about it. It's similar, but you're wrong, and you actually can make the change. Again, you, you rob yourself of opportunities to improve uh, both the world around you and yourself, your own character, for example. Um, it's just who I am, right? That, that kind of attitude. And both objectivism and stoicism take that issue really seriously. Uh, so that I think one of the reasons I wanted to give the talk is there's, there's significant overlap, or I'll put it this way, I'll flip that. There's interesting overlap between Stoicism and Objectivism and significant disagreement, and we'll get into both. Um, the other reason I wanted to talk about, about this, so one thing, it's, 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 it's getting popular in the culture. Um, they're offering people guidance, people are responding to it, and they're tapping into a philosophic issue that's really important, uh, uh, and objectivism would agree with that aspect. Um, the other aspect of it is that um, this whole morning track, the early 8.40 a.m. <laughs> morning track, uh, has been highlighting, or highlighting, featuring um, faculty of uh, Ayn Rand, uh, ARI's Objectivist Academic Center. Uh, so Ben Bayer gave a couple of the talks, he's faculty, also Mike Mazza gave a talk. I'm giving another one, and then tomorrow morning, the same time, uh, the whole faculty, including Ankar Gatte, is going to be giving you know a, a kind of a Q and A panel, um, and I've taught Stoicism in the Objectivist Academic Center. I don't teach them to be Stoics, but um, we we introduce I introduced Stoic philosophy to them partly to to my students, partly because I want them to grapple with um, um, other other philosophic perspectives that both have significant overlap, like this is their simil real similarities uh, to objectivism. Similarities, not identity, but similarities to objectivism. Uh, and also differences, and to help them think better about, so how is the objectivist perspective different from what is being said here? And that helps sharpen their perspective on what objectivism is. Um, and then also, well, that's it. That get them to kind of appreciate that there are other philosophic perspectives out there that are actually really interesting to actually grapple with. And it's interesting to watch other philosophers, other thinkers grapple with problems that they are grappling with, that objectivism that Ayn Rand had to grapple with. Um, and I think the more widely one explores those areas where other, other thinkers are grappling with the problems, uh, similar problems across time, I think you, your, your understanding and appreciation of, the, of philosophy, of the difficulty of the issues, and I think, frankly, of other thinkers uh, will grow because a lot of uh, a lot of people's first exposure to philosophy, it's certainly, this is true of me, uh, has, was objectivism. So you read Ayn Rand and this sort of brings you into the whole world of philosophy, and, but you're often not familiar with other perspectives and I think that's valuable. Okay, uh, so that's all by way of motivation why I wanted to give the talk and why I think it's significant. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll read one thing. Uh, no, I'll, I will read very little, don't worry. This comes from Ayn Rand's uh, essay, The Metaphysical versus the Man-Made. 
So if you want the go-to spot for uh, looking at the objectivist perspective on this, uh, this is, the, I think, probably the most important essay. Uh, it's a 1973 essay. That's when I was born. Um, so it's extra important. Um, and she starts with uh, a, a quote of this oh, famous serenity prayer. You've probably heard it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. And then skipping a bit. That statement, she says, is profoundly true as a summary and a guideline. It names the mental attitude which a rational man must seek to achieve. The statement is beautiful in its eloquent simplicity, but the achievement of that attitude involves philosophy's deepest metaphysical moral issues. So this is clearly something that objectivism makes a big deal out of as well. Uh, so what do the Stoics think about this? What is up to us, what is not? So we're transitioning. Um, and here I'll, I'll read only my second thing. This is from the handbook of Epictetus. So he's a former slave turned uh, philosophy professor, put it that way teacher. And he says, <clears throat> and we'll get into the details here, it, it shouldn't be too hard to follow. He says, some things are up to us and some are not. Our opinions are up to us and our impulses, that's what stimulates us to act, I'll talk about that. Our desires, our aversions, in short, whatever is our own doing. So these are the things that are up to us. Our opinions, our impulses, our desires, our aversions. Our bodies are not up to us, nor are our, our possessions, our reputations, or our public offices, or, that is, whatever is not our own doing. The things that are up to us are by nature free, unhindered, unimpeded. The things that are not up to us are weak, enslaved, hindered, not our own. So remember, if you think that things naturally enslaved are free, or that things that are, n are not your own are your own, you will be thwarted, miserable, upset, and you'll blame both gods and men. But if you think that only what is yours is yours, and that what is not your own is not your own, then no one will ever coerce you, no one will ever hinder you, you will blame no one, you will accuse no one, you will... You will not do a single thing unwillingly. You will have no enemies, and no one will harm you, because you will not be harmed at all. Okay. So what is up to us um, when it comes to... So I sigh a lot. Now I'm like, I don't want to be here. I'm bored. <laughs> I naturally sigh. I don't know why that is. Somebody pointed that out to me. Like, are you? You want to be here? Uh, I do. So, <laughs> so what is up to us uh, for the Stoics is fundamentally cognitive in nature. And I think that's one of the similarities with objectivism, is that what is fundamentally under one's control, as they put it, we'll talk about that control later, but what is fundamentally under one's control or up to us uh, is cognitive. It's, the, it's essentially the use of our reason. And so that's why our opinions are up to us our desires and aversions and so on. But to get what, how exactly they think about that, and I think this is part of what's interesting about it, is how they think actions, our own actions, how they take place, like what needs to take place for us to engage in certain kinds of actions. Uh, and they have a certain kind of model of how the mind works and how that m motivates action. So I'll introduce a couple of terms that, that I won't really treat technically. Um, but the first, so, an impulse is some sort of psychological movement of the soul. You don't need to think too much about that, but it's, it's whatever it stimulates an action. There's no actions without an impulse. And we speak normally about an impulse. I did something on impulse. It's what motivates and stimulates an action. Not motivates, stimulates an action. Um, but what does it take to have an impulse? What does it have to take to have an impulse to get you to act in a certain kind of way? Uh, and the Stoic view was that we are confronted with the, what they call impressions. 
And to put this in the least technical way, because they have all sorts of categorizations of kinds of impressions and so on. Um, an impression is when something strikes you as being the case. Something strikes you as being bad. Something strikes you as being unfortunate. Uh, it's just, it seems to be the case that I've lost something. This strikes me as round, right? So some of these can be perceptual. Some of these can be what they call sensory impressions. Some of them can be rational impressions. You know, so when somebody makes a claim, it sounds plausible, something strikes you in a certain kind of way. So we get all sorts of impressions, um, ways in which things strike us to be a certain way. And impre these are both impressions of fact and impressions of value. Something seems to us good, something seems to us bad, something seems to us true, something seems to us false. Um, and, but those impressions, although it seems to us to be such and such, they don't force us to accept these things as true or as good or as valuable. We're like a kind of gatekeeper. Um, one of the ways in which the Stoics put, uh, explain imp impressions is there, sorry, I have an impression as of messing up my mic, um, is, is that they're like messengers, some of which are reliable messengers, some of which are unreliable messengers. It's, it's, it's as if someone runs up to you and says, look, this is good, this is a good thing that happened. Uh, or you've suffered a loss, you know. Um, but their view is your fundamental control is whether you accept those propositions, in effect, as true or false, whether you accept them as giving you uh, a correct statement of a thing's value or disvalue. So you're like a gatekeeper. Uh, like, uh, and they say, so what you must do in order to accept uh, a statement of tru a truth or a statement of value is you must give your assent, A-S-S-E-N-T, assent, uh, your yes, uh, you must say yes to it, in effect. So uh, something strikes you as being tragic. And you think about it, and you say, no, this is, this is indeed, and this is my view, it is indeed tragic, what happened. This is, I'm giving my assent to it, and now I take it on as one of my beliefs. Something tragic happened to me. Um, but you can also, and they think this is also really important, you can withhold your assent. Uh, in some cases, it's not clear exactly what happened, whether that was a tragedy, you failed to get some job. Is, is, this, is this tragic? Well, you have to think about that. It, you know, it could be. It could be tragic, or it could be something that's it's unfortunate, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a setback, but it's not tragic. It's, may, you might think it's an unfortunate or something. Um, so you can withhold your assent, or you can reject, uh, you can reject it. So... Um, what they think is fundamentally under your control is your ability to accept um, what you think is true and what you think is good or bad. Um, and now, the, how this works is that you have impulses, uh, you, something seems to be the case, you assent to it, you say, yeah, this is the case. And now that has um, some kind of, that can stimulate action uh, on your part because, and I just put it in this way, and I think this is correct that it's the beliefs that you hold, the things that you think are true and false, and it's the values that you accept, the things that you think are good and bad, noble, shameful, and so on, that color and shape your own character uh, and shape your own mo motivations. Like, why do you pursue the kinds of things that you pursue? Why do you, why do you care about some thing or some person the way you do? And the answer to that is what? You have to look back at what? Your beliefs, your values, the kinds of things that you think are true and false, the, th the kinds of things that you think are good and evil. Um, so they had they had a good they had a pretty good understanding of the fact that what shapes a character are your beliefs and values. And their view was that you, but you have control over that, not much more, but you have control over what values you hold, what beliefs you hold, think are true. Now, if we look at what is not up, up to us, so I've said that they call that the regulation of your assent. So you regulate the, uh, uh, what you assent to, what you refuse to assent to, and what you simply withhold judgment about if it's unclear. And that's the gatekeeper to your values and beliefs and so on. 
Um, now, why is this important? It's because that shapes your character. Your, your character really is just that sort of cluster of be core beliefs and values that um, explain your motivations, uh, make you who you are, make you the kind of person you are. Um, so it's of major moral importance for them. So what is not up to us? What is outside of our control? Literally everything else. Like literally everything else. Your body, um, your wealth, your possessions, um, other people, other people's opinions, um, everything that's external to your will, if you want to put it that way. What's outside of your control is anything that cannot be secured or had exclusively by your sovereign power of assent and your ability to um, think. So beyond that, everything is outside of your control. And so you shouldn't care that much about it. So there are ap action implications for this. So what you should be really, really, really concerned about in life, what's the single most important thing in all of life, is the state of your character. This is what you have control of. Like, we have this expression, you know, uh, ought implies can. You know, you can't, uh, you can't tell people they ought to do things if they're unable. You don't blame them or praise them for things that they have no control over. You don't praise me because I'm 5'11". I refuse to be under six feet tall, but I'm 5'11". I have to be honest with myself. Um, but you can't praise or blame people for things that are outside their control. And so when they think of what's the, what's the, the sphere in which mor morality applies, moral judgment applies, and so on, it's the sphere over which we have control of things. And their view is, well, you basically just have control over your thoughts and hence your character, hence your moral character. Um, and this gets us, uh, and we don't have to talk too much about this, but feel free to ask about it, is that um, the reason why we want to make these distinctions is because it matters morally to us. The things that are outside of our control are neither good nor evil. Nothing that happens outside our will is either good or evil. It's what they call indifferent. And now when we speak of indifference, uh, we think like you don't care, it doesn't matter, it doesn't one way or another. It's not quite that. What they really mean is um, that it has nothing to do with good or evil. It has nothing to do with one's moral character. So how much money you are, whether you're good looking or not, um, whether you have a prestigious public office or something, none of this, uh, whether you live or die, <laughs> so that's important. <laughs> your life and death is not up control, your sickness and health is not up to, you, up to you. None of these things on their view, life and death, sickness, health, money, wealth, beauty, etc. none of that matters to you, your moral character. None of that matters when it comes to moral virtue or moral vice. So ev all, your whole control, your whole focus should be on your moral character and making sure you're virtuous by their standards. Um, and one of the things the Stoics thinks people um, <coughs> mess their lives up um, on a regular basis about is they think that things, uh, they, they, the things that are not up to you, on, out of, outside of your control, all that basically everything else beyond what you can control with your will, um, People place way too much emphasis on these things. Um, most people, they think, um, place a lot of emphasis on things like sickness and health, life and death, um, getting, I'm talking about myself now, you know, getting a house, having a nice meal, going on vacation, I don't know, whatever you think, uh, getting a new book, uh, whatever you think these kind of material things, the external things, the things over which you don't have direct control, most people spend their lives on that, and, and that's their primary focus and a lot less time thinking about and trying to shape their moral character and thinking about whether they're virtuous or vicious. Um, and Stoics, the, the Stoics think you need to fundamentally reorient your life back toward the inner, back toward, the, back toward moral character, and really treat the external things, the things outside one's will, the things one can't control, um, as of little importance. Um, Now, so far, we've said that there's a fundamental kind of control they think you have over your assent and your ability to control what judgments and values you accept, and that has the implications of what kind of character you hold. 
and they think that that is where you should place your primary concern, not external things, not whether you live or die, as they, they like to quote about Socrates, you know, uh, if they send him to prison, he says, you can imprison my body, but you've done me no harm. Because the only kind of harm that can happen is if you become vicious. The only kind of good that can happen to you is if you become virtuous. Everything else is indifferent. So that they have this way of thinking that you have something you can control, and it orients you in a certain way to your life. And you should, you should, most of you should all reorient your life because you're not doing it on the Stoic perspective. Uh, now, there's a wrinkle, which is more than a wrinkle. Um, let me just pause there for a second. What sounds good about that? A focus on moral character, okay. I mean, that is, that is certainly important, at least certainly from the objectivist perspective. Yeah, Kevin? Yeah, so, uh, so he's saying that we have a perspective. It's important to have a perspective on what's good or uh, vicious or virtuous and so on uh, before you figure out how to shape your character because you're trying to shape it in the image uh, of a certain ideal. Now, I won't be talking too much about the virtues, but they have sort of traditional virtues, uh, Greek virtues. Let's go here. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, what, the, what the questioner stated was that it's, it's really important to have this way of facing the world, of trying to figure out, sort out, what are the kinds of things I can control, impact, change, effect, and the, what are these kinds of things that these are, it's like, you know, the little bumper pool, right, where they have the little fixed things on the pool table, and they just, you know, you just got to navigate around those. Those are just hard facts, and you just got to accept them. I think, yeah, I think that is an important, uh, impor uh, important thing to know for your whole way of looking at life. Um, Oh, I, let me go in order we had. Yeah, Sebastian. Yeah, so that's my next topic. Um, because everything I've been saying now, and you'll find this, say, in Epictetus, is in the language of this is up to us, this is under our control, this is what we can manage, this is where we're autonomous, free, unhindered. Um, th that's the wrinkle. Uh, it, which is a big wrinkle, but I'll, I'll come up with that. Yeah, Tom, and then I'll move on. Okay, great. The, yours were answered. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think all that is right. Um, now, the issue about f free will and determinism, like I said, we've been talking about, like, these are the things that are under your control. Are they really? Um, now, there is a question, a, a genuine question for scholars, in effect, is Epictetus himself, probably uniquely, um, bringing into the Stoic worldview some kind of notion of free will? Um, and that, I think, is unclear. I think the answer is probably no, um, but that's more of a scholarly issue. Um, let me tell you about the Stoic's worldview. So let's step back. We've talked about regulating ascent, working on your character, focusing on internal things, not external things. But let's step back and look at their worldview. Um, the Stoics were determinists, so the idea is everything, well here's, let me put it this way. The universe is composed of two things, an active principle and a passive principle. The active principle is God. Sometimes they call it Zeus, sometimes they call it fate, um, sometimes they call it the Logos, you know, it's kind of almost like, it could be because it's a kind of a divine reason. And there's passive, inert matter. And the entire universe is composed and th thoroughly blended, they call it through and through blending, of God, the active, rational principle, and the passive, inert matter which gets shaped by God, by that rational principle. And so not only is the universe con entirely composed of God and matter, you know, or in effect reason and stuff, uh, I mean, this is what, this is, in their view, this is what le makes it, uh, the universe uh, rationally intelligible, because there is a divine mind, a divine reason that structures everything that happens, structures literally everything that happens, down to its last detail. 
Um, and this is sometimes known as their, uh, their doctrine of fate. And by fate, they didn't just mean, you know, lady luck or something like that where, uh, well, very early Stoics, I think, meant something a little bit more like that, like that, that certain fixed points in your life, like when you're going to die, when you're going to be born, are part of your fate. Um, but this is really an all-encompassing deterministic framework where nothing happens that wasn't predetermined because everything else is simply the unfolding of the plan of the divine reason in the world. Um, well, hang on, what about, what about the autonomous mind? Right? What about my, my, my reason, my own reason? Um, that is a fragment of God. So Epictetus says, look, I couldn't make your body free. Sorry. This is Epictetus giving some words to God, God's, as if God's saying this. Uh, look, I couldn't make your poor body free. If I could make your possessions free and unhindered, I'd do it. But look, you know, I can't. So I gave you a part of myself. Um, they don't anthropomorphize God too much, but... Uh, but it's just a fragment of the divine reason unfolding in you. Um, and so the Stoics were constantly having to sort of fight off the objection uh, coming from other thinkers at the time. How can you say that you ha you're morally responsible for your character and so on, and that you're morally responsible for your actions, or that frankly anything is up to you uh, if you have this whole deterministic framework where everything is predetermined, everything that happens had to happen. And they even have a view that the universe is cyclic and that you'll keep going through the same cycles, the same exact events. You'll be at this lecture again, the same thing. All of the same events will repeat down to their last detail, down to the last drop or, uh, of rain on a windshield. It's the same. It has the same logical causal structure. It's the same unfolding of God's divine plan. Where does free will fit into any of this stuff? Uh, and I think one of the difficulties here is that it's difficult to conceptualize the phenomenon of free will. I think it's, it's, it's one thing to observe yourself making choices, but it's difficult to, um, to conceptualize how to think about what is going on when one makes choices, what volition amounts to and then how to integrate that with your other views of the world. I mean, you find today, often, it's <coughs> um, scientists and scientifically-minded people were often accept determinism, and this is, this is what it is to be scientific, and this is the normal. Um, and then they're, then they're faced with a problem as well. It's like, how do you deal? I mean, you make choices every day, right? You deliberate, do I get the Toyota, do I get the Honda? Like, what, they, you deliberate, you think about things, and you think about your life plan, you think about important issues, and you come down on something, and you make a choice. How do you integrate those two? Can you integrate those two? Because you should integrate like my perspective on the world and my perspective on myself and my capabilities. You need to integrate those. Um, and sometimes people will find they just don't integrate. Um, and so it's a, it's a difficult thing to conceptualize. Now, how they tried to reconcile these, um, I think the best, I mean, many of them, I didn't, don't think just saw, saw the problem. Uh, but there was a thinker who was the major architect of Stoic philosophy. His name is Chrysippus. Um, he tried to answer the, the question as follows. He gives an example of a cylinder. And he says, m some people say, what caused the cylinder to roll? And one would say, well, that's, there was an external push. Right? There's an external cause. Something pushed it, and it rolled. He said, well, that's not a complete answer to the question, because the cylinder rolls because of its shape, too. Right? So part of, uh, there's an internal cause, something about the nature of the cylinder, namely its shape, that causes it to roll. If you push it and it was a, a cube, it might tumble or it might slide, but it's not rolling. So um, actions that are up to us are ones that require an internal cause from us to, in order to occur. So it's not just that there's an external influence on me and that causes me to act. It's there's an e external influence combined with an internal cause, say a judgment, a belief, a value, my moral character. Th 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 there's an internal cause which it has, which is necessary for the action to happen. Uh, so there's a contributory cause. The out external thing is like, you insulted me, right? And that's an external cause. My me getting angry. Well, I'm not going to get angry if I don't care about insults or if I didn't hear you. 
right? It, it, some, something of my reaction depends on some internal cause. Like, I don't like being insulted, right? It's something about my values, right? Um, or you, it's, I'm being insulted by someone I really care about. I'm really upset, right? So it's a lot of these things, th these actions that we take, the ones that are up to us, uh, won't occur without some internal cause coming from our judgments, our beliefs, our values, and those are things that we allegedly are up to us. Um, so I think when it comes to the way uh, Chrysippus tries to manage that difficulty between we have this whole deterministic framework, and on the other hand, some things are, quote, up to us. Up to us really just means that the action is coming from an internal cause for, for, uh, within us that has to do with our judgments, our beliefs, our values. But importantly, as far as I can tell, um, no, our, our gatekeeper is gone now. Because as far as I can tell, and I guess this is right, the Chrysippus' view is that your ascent is also fated. Because see, that seems to be, well, hold on, I still have my ascent, right? Uh, and his view is, no, your ascent is just as fated as anything else. Otherwise, we're introducing an uncaused action. Uh, so it's co-fated along with your, the action that you're going to take. So that you will assent to, yes, I was indeed insulted, um, is co-fated with my being angry. You know? So it's, there's a notion of that your assent is no longer, uh, in some sense, free, unhindered, really, truly yours. Um, it's just fated as long as it, with everything else. Now, I think... One of the things I think is interesting in this sort of overlap is, I, and I think that what the Stoics and objectivists are trying to do, objectivism is trying to do, is trying to isolate and identify the, the locus of control. Like, what is, the, what is the fundamental area in which we, at root, have free will or have control over something? And I think both, uh, both, both philosophies located in something cognitive and something having to do with our reason and our ability to regulate our reason. And because that gives it, I mean, the way, the way it, Stoicism is often presented, it sounds a little like objectivism in the sense, that, uh, on this point, that man is a being of self-made soul, as Ayn Rand put it. That you shape your own character by the thinking that you do or non-thinking, by the values that you accept, by the beliefs that you hold. That's how you form your character. That's how you shape the kind of person you are, your personal identity. And that's what explains uh, the reasons why you act the way you do uh, they pursue the goals you do and so on. I think that's right. Um, but clearly the major, the, maybe there are many differences, but the major difference here with objectivism has to do with objectivism takes free will seriously. Well, maybe that's not the fair way to put it. Objectivism accepts free will. Um, and it thinks that uh, there is a real and genuine control that one has over one's mind, over the processing over the, I mean, in, in essence, it's about your free will consists in your ability to engage, I don't like engage, to exercise your rational faculty, to exercise your conceptual faculty. What, as long as you're awake, you're perceiving, you're seeing stuff, right? But to start thinking, to grasping connections, looking for similarities, reach, reaching concepts, arriving at knowledge, seeking out knowledge. I mean, that is a process that one has to uh, uh, engage in, initiate, direct, control, maintain. Uh, and it's that control over the processing that is fundamentally ours, uh, which is unhindered, <laughs> free, etc. cetera. Um, so the, 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 the split, uh, between what is up to us and what is not up to us uh, in Stoicism is often called st the dichotomy of control in, in some of the popular literature. Have you ever, anyone heard of that before? The dichotomy of control? It's just that issue of the things you can control. Well, objectivism has a dichotomy of control as well, but it's formulated differently. Um, the way Ayn Rand forms it, formulates it, it's the metaphysical versus the man-made. That's how she conceptualizes that distinction. Um, it's the, meta, it's the metaphysically given, and what she puts that is, and, and I'm, I'm for some reason assuming that you know what that means. Um, what she calls the metaphysically given is, it boils down to the nature of nature. So that is what is not up to you. Um, the identities and properties of things that, ha that have in nature, um, that is what is fixed. It is what it is. 
no conscious action can change the nature of nature. It's what we must accept. It's the basic framework that we have to accept in order to sort of deal with reality. And the w one of the ways that she puts it is nature to be commanded must be obeyed. In other words, if you want to be able to know how to deal with nature, to shape nature, to fit our needs, to, well, to deal with it, you need to understand what its nature is, what it, the, the identities and characteristics of the things that you deal with all around you, and that's the only way you can come to deal with them. So you do have a power of, uh, of, cr of creation and control, but the power of creation for human beings is simply the rearrangement uh, of what's in nature. Not, not creating anything in nature, your consciousness or your volition is not omnipotent, it's, it's not that it has no bounds, uh, it's that the fundamental control is over your thinking, over your processing. And then as a result, again, somewhat similar to the Stoics, is you, uh, that, that's what gives you your ability to control the aspects of your character and shape the motives um, that, in effect, govern your actions. So one of the things I want to end on, and then I want to get to questions, because I think when it comes to Stoicism, there, there tend to be a lot of questions. Um, I think, I think it's valuable to look at other thinkers that have closely aligned views on certain issues because it helps you ask questions like this. What is the difference between, um, does objectivism hold this perspective, that you have the ability to regulate assent, to the ability to be a gatekeeper, in effect, uh, to what values you take on and what beliefs you accept? And I think the answer is yes. I don't think it has sort of a linear model where it's, it's, it's impression, <laughs> ascent, <laughs> impulse, but that's often the way it's simply presented, but it's, it's, it's more complex than that. But uh, yeah, I think that's right. But it also emphasizes, and this is something I've been dealing with because I've been writing on issues of free will and stoicism and determinism and really thinking about that problem, uh, is that it's very difficult, and objectivism realizes it is difficult to conceptualize the phenomenon of free will. Um, how exactly to formulate it, and there are a lot of questions that come up that you have to deal with. Um, but also, I think it's important to read other thinkers like this because you start to develop a respect um, for what they did right, what they got correct. Um, now, one of the things that I found really <laughs> uh, valuable when I read objectivism was grasping, and this is a related point, is grasping the um, the, the cognitive basis of emotions, I mean, the objectivist perspective on that, right? So emotions are, they're, they're products in effect. They're products of what kind of judgments you have about facts and values and stuff, and you change the, change the judgment, change the emotion. Um, and th that gave me, for the first time, the perspective, oh, so you can manage your emotional life? Like, these th things aren't just, this is how I feel, and that's the way it is, and, you know, it'll go away, I hope, you know? But it's like, no, why are you feeling this? What are the judgments that you've made uh, what are the judgments that underlie that, that, that stimulate that kind of emotion? And that was really empowering for me as a teenager. I was like, uh, and I learned that from Ayn Rand. The Stoics got there first. And I think one of the interesting things is that this is one of the things people are finding really empowering. And, oh, Stoicism really helped my life. And that doesn't surprise me. It's not exactly Stoicism as a whole philosophy, right? There's a lot of things in Stoicism that they simply drop, accept, modify, change, abandon. Um, but they are tapping into some of the things that are actually right about it. Um, and so I think it's also, it gives you some understanding of like, yeah, why people would adopt that. Because there are things that are valuable and that we would take as valuable as well. Uh, okay, so that's all for today, uh, all from what I have to say for today. I want to move to questions. Uh, I'm sure we have plenty. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's, yeah, go uh, ahead. Hi. Th thank you for a great talk. Um, my question has to do with uh, voluntarism. I is there a connection between that voluntarism and, and uh, you know, the stoicism? Is it sort of a modern form of, of, uh, of stoicism? Because you see a lot of many libertarians, for example, who, who, is, who espouse uh, Voluntarism and it sort of what's voluntarism? I only know voluntarism from a theological debate about 
is yeah. the idea that it's, it's, it's actually in, in a way an absence of a, it doesn't have a full philosophy behind it, but it's more like what I want is okay and, and it can be delimited in whatever way I want it to be. It allows uh, the, almost an absence of philosophy to, to guide, let's say a libertarian to say, uh, it it's, ties into the golden rule and all those other bromides in a way, but that, that's what, as, as I understand it, I was wondering if you had any, any thoughts on that. I don't know that I exactly understand what voluntarism is, but I'll say this though. Um, from both the Stoic perspective and the objectivist perspective, th I'll just say this. They, they both think that reason is what should be guiding you. The reason is what should be guiding your actions, your choices, because it, I think this is true both of Stoicism and objectivism, but in a slightly different way when Stoicism is. The goal is to live in accordance with nature. So the idea is nature has a nature. <laughs> Human nature has a nature, has, has a nature and um, it, it is what it is. And so you have to figure out what is the nature of the world around me? What is my own nature as a human being? And as a result, how do I use my reason to make sure my actions are in line which w with what is appropriate for someone of my nature living in a world of that nature? So it's reason should be guiding it. So it's not a kind of a subjectivism. Um, if, that's what, if that's what the question was leading to, I wasn't sure. Yeah, th I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a, it's a good thing, but you yeah. hear a lot about it uh, as, as a way to, to replace philosophy. So it, it, is, it isn't reason-based. It, it's, a, it's a will uh, disconnected from reason, quite opposite from what objectivism says. In okay. uh, objectivism, reason is will and vice versa, or a part of it, whereas they, they disconnect it. Uh, okay. I, I guess in that sense it's different from Stoicism? Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're yeah, welcome. It's an online question. Yep. Do you think Stoicism has the malevolent premise of life? Yes. Next. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think that, so go read, you'll enjoy it. Go read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Now there, it is a sad book. And it's, see, it's both sad and noble. There's a sense in which Marcus is, now of course Marcus, he's, a, he's, a, he's an emperor, he's got a lot on his plate, right? He's on military campaigns, sleeping on a cold camp bed, you know, uh, fighting off the hordes. So he has a rough life, he, a number of his children died uh, early, and it was just sort of like, it's, so there are particulars to his case, but when you, when you look at the way he presents his philosophy, I think it's a real encapsulation of this worldview because it's, on the one hand, philosophically, stoically, he's committed to the notion that this is the best of all possible worlds, that everything that happens happens for the best because this divine reason structures everything providentially for man. It structures everything for the best. To want things to be other than they are is to want something worse. So it's already the best that it, it, that it can be. And so he tries to tell himself that a lot. But then a lot of what you get in, in the whole atmosphere of it is often, what's the point of it all? The futility of existence, the futility of success, the irrelevance of failure. This is all going to happen again. You're going to be at this same lecture. You know, it's like, uh, I guess I'll be taking notes, not taking notes, sleeping. The same thing will happen. <laughs> what does it matter if I took really good notes? I mean, I don't, it, there's a futility, that, uh, a sense of futility, and also a sense of the insignificance of external things. Yeah, you got a house. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm an emperor. I'll die, I'll die too. I'll end up as uh, dust like you. It, it just... Everything is ephemeral, you know, and you get this whole sense that what one needs to do is to f get yourself to fo hold a perspective that makes you invulnerable as much as possible, to retreat into the inner citadel of the mind where you can control everything, where whatever you want, you can have, because you don't extend your desires beyond what you can directly control with your own consciousness. And then you'll have everything you want, as I said from the Epictetus at the beginning, you'll never be frustrated, you'll never be angry, because you'll always get what you want, and you'll never fail to get what you, what you, you, know, what you wanted. Uh, and I think that the preparation for suffering as a way of life, I think something like the, it's a kind of malevolent universe 
I mean, they, they don't think the universe is evil or anything. It's just that there's, there's that sense that preparation for adversity has to be center stage, as opposed to how do I go out and live a great life and just, like, wring the most out of life uh, I can? It's like, no, that's more like objectivism. So there's that fundamental difference. Yeah. Um, did, did anybody, does anybody try to give an explanation for why we should care about character or by what standard we should judge our character? Why we should care about character, um, they, the Stoics think that virtue, now er, all the Greek philosophers think that the goal, the goal of life is some form of happiness, eudaimonia, it's like some kind of a, 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 a fl I shouldn't say flourishing, uh, some kind of a good life. Uh, now the Stoics think that virtue is necessary and sufficient for happiness. So that if you have moral virtue, if you have the state of your character in a certain way, if you have courage, if you have prudence, as they call it, uh, if you have uh, uh, moderation and so on, if you have these virtues in your character, that is it. That's all you need. I mean, you could get a car or a toilet brush or whatever, but it's, that's irrelevant to your happiness or unhappiness. All you need is virtue. And so they're f focus on a but I don't think they know why you need to be virtuous. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, from the objectivist perspective, is the whole reason virtue is a means to an end. Uh, virtue is, uh, virtues try to m mark out the causal means of achieving the values that you need to live your life, to be happy, uh, to survive, to flourish. And so virtue is a means to an end for them. Now, they, they think that if you have virtue, it, happiness comes with it. But it's not right to think of it as a means to an end. And objectivism thinks of it as a means to an end. Do they have a reason to think like why courage is a virtue? Like why isn't cowardice a virtue? Um, well, uh, two different things. One is courage is a virtue. So the, right. all oh, the normal sure. reasons yes. that you would think why courage is a virtue, they bring up. Um, but the other reason is, uh, again, remember that what we're doing is we are formed by God, given reason by God on their view and that the exercise of our distinct uh, aspect, which is reason, which is part of God in us, the development of that demands in some way the, the, these, these kind of moral virtues. I mean, they, they think this is getting into something you'd have to go read, to, but they think of um, the virtues as aspects of rationality. There are ways in which one can be rational. Uh, and that virtue is one in a way, and you can you can kind of separate, you can distinguish aspects of them. So all all sorts of interesting things to look into. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Don't the Stoics conflate influence with primary causes when the Stoics claim that your represent your represent uh, reputation and property are out of your control? You can influence others to have a good reputation, but the primary cause is their choice to hold you in that way. So don't they kind of conflate the two? Yeah, so the question is, there's one thing to say that I can influence uh, how you think about me, right? If I start insulting you, you might look, you think, oh, I, I thought I might like that guy, now I don't, right? So I can impact or influence uh, that. Um, but they're, imp they, and they would agree with that. Um, but, the, uh, but because they think that everything else is outside one's control, because it isn't really up to one's control whether someone really likes you, you can't make someone like you. Now you can, you can, in, you can, I don't know, be a nice person. You can be, uh, you can be rational. You can be helpful. You can be whatever. You can, you can take the actions that you would think would make someone like you or be more likely to like you. But you can't control that. You don't have control over that. And so, um, so they they do recognize that what you actually do can impact other things. But then once you sort of fire the arrow off, it's out of the bow. It's, you can't do anything. And so it's, uh, in that respect, it's fu it is fundamentally outside your control. Because I can't, what if somebody reacts irrationally to my helpfulness and thinks that I'm cynically trying to, uh, I don't know, ingratiate myself or something? I, you don't have control over that. It's a good arrow analogy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I interact a lot with libertarians and conservatives, and I've noticed that um, there is uh, there there is a lot of adoption of stoic ideas, and mm -hmm. I think that there's potential to uh, plant the seeds of objectivist ideas. And I was wondering if you thought at all uh, for people who are of stoic uh, persuasion, which I think 
that kind of attitude is increasing in this country. Um, I think we have a, a very vital ground to sort of get people into a, objectivism. And I'm wondering if you can recommend uh, for someone who's going down the Stoic path uh, any like particular seeds of persuasion that uh, and things for them to think about that that might get them in a more objectivist direction. Yeah, I mean, one of them. Uh, it depends on their motivation for being interested in Stoicism. So if you take something that's something like um, the Stoics think that you can regulate your emotions by regulating your judgments, you know, uh, I mean, objectivism has that perspective as well, and they think because and they should find that valuable. I find it valuable from objectivism. People are learning it from the Stoics. Uh, send them to some of what Ayn Rand has to say about the nature of emotions, and uh, uh, you can get this in um, uh, the objectivist ethics. You can get it also in philosophy who needs it, uh, mm -hmm. about what emotions are, how they relate to reason, and so on. Um, if they're interested in the whole dichotomy of control, as it's called popularly, you know, what you can control and what you can't, uh, recommend uh, the metaphysical versus the man-made. Um, I, I think that's valuable. But if they're interested in Stoicism because what they're looking for is imperviousness to pain, uh, you know, like that movie, Get Hard. You know, if they're looking for um, trying to harden themselves against adversity, uh, maybe give them the fountainhead. Uh, because often, uh, when I look at the way Rourke faces life, I think some elements of, uh, someone interested in Stoicism will, may, Rourke may resonate with them. He's not a Stoic, but yeah. Um, but if they're interested in it because they're interested in a kind of a t detachment for the purpose of tranquility, uh, I mean, no one should downgrade peace of mind. <laughs> but the end of life is not peace of mind and tranquility and detaching oneself from con other concerns that you can't control it or whatever. That if, if that's what they're interested in, they probably would not be interested in objectivism because objectivism is fundamentally an ambitious philosophy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Here's an online question. Could you say more about the Stoic approach to value pursuit given their aspiration for invulnerability? Yes, uh, so it's often pointed out that, um, well, hold on, the Stoics aren't all about detachment and all of that. I mean, look at, look at Marcus Aurelius. He's a Roman Empire, for God's sake. You know, uh, Roma, he's not an empire, Roman emperor. Uh, they did things out there, and they didn't lie on their couch and say, woe is me, and the, the universe will just tumble on as it tumbles. And I, No, um, but part of this has to do with their, um, their conception of what is, it, what it is proper for human beings to do. So there are things, they have a technical term called appropriate, but there's, there are things that are appropriate to our nature. Uh, so it is, it is appropriate early on to be concerned with one's self-preservation. Nature has actually set us up that way, uh, to have a concern for uh, oneself and for one's uh, family, for things that are close to one. We see that all of this in the animal world. They take care of their young and stuff. And so human beings have a natural attachment toward things that are close to them in that way. Um, but they extend that beyond, um, so the, or you have an attachment to, you're, you're an Athenian, right? And you might care more about Athenians than you would about Spartans or, or whoever. Or, um, but the idea is that because we all have a kinship through reason with God, we are all, in effect, one family in a wider, more abstract sense. Uh, and so we have obligations to other people, duties to other people. And also, so one aspect of it is there's a kind of a kinship notion where we have obligations and duties outside our own inner circle. Um, and also... Um, no, I already lost my thought. Um, I had two thoughts, and when I try to juggle them in my head, sometimes I lose one. Uh, oh, that's the other thing is, um, because <coughs> we, what we're doing in life is working out God's plan, and, the, and wh where we are in life is where God wants us, is that you act, or you, you have a role to fulfill. So, if I'm an Athenian, I have a role to play as a citizen. If I'm a father, uh, I have a role to play uh, to fulfill as a father. Uh, if my circumstances put me in, the, in I'm, I'm a general, I have a job to do. Uh, and so it's about uh, fulfilling the role. If I'm a cripple, play that role well, says Epictetus. 
So if nature has made you a cripple, play that role well. If it has put you in a well-connected, politically connected family where you have ability to have a role in the state, that is the role that you should play. Nature has given you that, and you have an obligation to fulfill it. So that, that's where it takes you to, like, why would you go out and do things? And yeah. Hey, Aaron. So as you said before, in objectivism, the moral character and acting the virtues, being virtuous is means and acting the causes to reach the effect, which are values, in a sense. That moral is the practical. And it seems that, but objectivism also recognizes that you, there are things which are beyond your control, the metaphysically given other people, and you may be perfectly moral, virtuous, and in pursuit of values, and still <laughs> maybe fail at some point. Yeah. But I think the conclusion which objectivism reaches is that you either try or what? Like, what's the alternative? If there is nothing else to do. Why do you think Stoicism and today, maybe it's more clear why, why it was in ancient Greece, but today, what is the motivation and justification to say, yeah, this is what I want, to not try and be in that state, which I think, from my perspective, is a miserable state. What do you think? How do they justify that? Yeah, that's a good state to be in. Um, okay, so uh, let me just reduce the question a little bit. So, st Stoicism puts the emphasis on get your moral character into the right state. And it's about your intentions, um, really, and not about what you... So, it's one thing to, uh, to want something to happen um, and keep it at the wanting level. Like, I've done what I want. I've desired the things I should desire. Uh, I've intended to do the things that's proper and moral to uh, intend to do. Um, but I shouldn't want the outcome to be anything other than it is, from a Stoic perspective. Because that, the way that it, and they put it is, um, don't want events to happen as you want them. Uh, want them to be as they happen. You know, so it's like, when, if they happen, that's, that's what you should be wanting. Because uh, you don't have any control over that. And again, that's the kind of predetermined good outcome. So you shouldn't want anything differently. But I, I, I agree that I think that's the wrong approach. It's like, no, I want the house. I don't want to be of a moral character such that my intention is to want a house. I want the actual house. I, want, I don't want to do whatever I can so I can feel like I did everything I could to get that date. No, I want a date. You know, like, I, I want romance in my life. I want somebody to fall in love with me. I want to like, have the closeness. I want to have the intimacy. I want to have somebody to share things with. It's not like I want to be the kind of person that somebody might, but no. I want the actual value out there in the world. I want to get a new Japanese knife. I want to go, <laughs> I, I, I like to cook, sorry. Uh, I want to go to sushi. I want to go on vacation. I want to go to Kyoto. There are all sorts of things that I want to do. And this is, this is in fact, part of my happiness, constitutive of my values, constitutive of my happiness. And I think the whole disparaging of mater the mater material goods, material values, is all misguided. Um, and I don't think they understand the spiritual meaning of material values, which is going to be another talk I'm going to give at some point. Um, partly because I'm so invested in the material uh, for spiritual reasons. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, time out. We got the time out sign. So I guess that's it. Thank you very much. I know it's early. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.